uh, Gabby take it away um, and sort of give a little introduction to this event. Hello, hola familia. It is wonderful to see you all again. And I hope that you enjoyed the career panel. I am thrilled to announce that we'll be starting our Afro Boricua Legal Perspective event, co sponsored with Yale Law School's Latinx Law Students Association. The event features Professor Tanya Hernandez, Yale Law, class of 1990, and Professor Ana Ramos Sayas, Yale College, 1990. We'll be recording the following portion of our celebration. If you're unable to join us for this event, please take a moment to exit the Zoom call. If you just joined the room, please mute your microphone. Thank you to everyone who helped make this event possible. Miguel Mauricio, a second year student at Yale Law School, will introduce our wonderful speakers. He graduated from UC Berkeley in 2016 and spent three years between graduating from Berkeley and starting uh, law school, working in the California State Senate as a legislative aide. Miguel, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all. Um, it's my my great honor to introduce our two phenomenal guests that we have today. So let's start first with uh, Professor Tanya Hernandez. So Tanya uh, Kateri Hernandez is the Archibald R. Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she teaches where she teaches anti-discrimination law, comparative employment discrimination, critical race theory, the science of implicit bias, and the law, new pathways to social justice and trust and wills. She received her uh, AB from Brown University and her JD from Yale Law School, where she served as notes editor of the Yale Law Journal. Professor Hernandez is an internationally recognized comparative race law expert and Fulbright scholar who has visited the University of Paris um, in Paris and the University of the West Indies Law School in Trinidad. She has previously served as a Law and Public Policy Affairs Fellow at Princeton University, a Faculty Fellow at the Institute for Research on Women at Rutgers University, a Faculty Fellow at the Fred T. Korematsu Center for Law and Equality, and as a Scholar in Residence at the uh, Skomberg Center for Research in Black Culture. Professor Hernandez is a Fellow of the American Bar Foundation, the American Law Institute, and the Academia uh, Puerto Ricana de Jurisprudencia y Legislación. Uh, Hispanic Business uh, Magazine selected her as one of its annual 100 Most Influential Hispanics, and Professor Hernandez serves on the editorial boards of the Brazilian Journal of Law and Justice and the Latino uh, Studies Journal published by Palgrave Macmillan Press. Professor Hernandez's scholarly interest is in the study of comparative race relations and anti-discrimination law, and her work in that area has pub uh, been published in numerous university law reviews like Cornell, Harvard, NYU, UC Berkeley, and our own Yale. Um, and it news out other news outlets like the New York Times, among other publications, including uh, her books, Racial Subordination in Latin America, The Role of the State, Customary Law and the New Civil Rights Response, Braille Research Perspective in Comparative Law, Racial Discrimination and Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination, and uh, Beacon Press is publishing her forthcoming book on Latino anti-Black bias, racial innocence, and the struggle for equality. Welcome, thank you for being here. Our second guest is Professor Ana Ramos Ayas. Ana Ramos Ayas is a Frederick Clifford Ford Professor of Ethnicity, Race and Migration, American Studies and Anthropology at Yale. Ramos Sayas received her BA in Economics and Latin American Studies from Yale College and her MA and PhD in Anthropology from Columbia University. She's the author of National Performance, Class, Race and Space in Puerto, Rico, in Puerto Rico and Chicago and Street Therapists, Affect, Race, and Neoliberal Personhood in Latino Newark. Ramos Sayas is, uh, is also the co-author of Latino Crossings, uh, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and the Politics of Race and Citizenship. Ramos Sayas has published journal articles in the fields of youth culture, race and critical race theory, citizen and migration, the anthropology of emotion and effect. Her most recent book, Parenting Empires, Class, Whiteness, and the Moral Economy of Privilege in Latin America, examines the parenting practices and subjectivities of Brazilian and Puerto Rican upper classes as these alter urban landscapes, provide moral justification for segregation, surveillance, and foreign intervention, and recast idioms of crisis, corruption, and austerity according to the dictums of US empire. Prior to joining Yale in two, uh, 2017, Ramos Sayas conducted postdoc work in educational evaluation research at Harvard, taught at R Rutgers University, New Brunswick, and occupied the Valentin Lizana y Paragua endowed chair at the City University of New York. Thank you both for being here and for uh, having this conversation with us. I'll turn it over to both of you. 
so I'm going to be serving as moderator, and I am so honored to be in the company of friend and most most admired colleague, um, Professor Tania Hernandez. Um, and I would like to, I, I mean, I, I want to leave uh, space, obviously, at the end for people to kind of jump in with their questions. But um, I also wanted to first thank um, the current DB members, co-chairs, and everyone involved in organizing this event um, for the invitation to moderate this um, and to engage in a conversation on a timely, super important topic of anti-Black bias within the Puerto Rican and the Latinx communities. Um, so to get us started, um, Dr. Hernandez, would you would you please give us maybe a little bit of background about how you came to view law specifically as a discipline and as a career, um, as the leading avenue through which you sought to examine race relations and discrimination, and also could you maybe share some um, specific events or situations in your educational or personal or intellectual um, process that may have led to this particular area? of research. Let me not be that person in the room who forgets to unmute herself. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing, and then mute herself when she needs to. Um, I just from procedural perspective, just want to say that if my Wi-Fi gets wonky, somebody send me a quick chat or Anna, raise your hand or something, and I'll just switch over to my cell phone. Um, but I am uh, zooming to you from Harlem. And uh, the Wi-Fi hmm, is a little temperamental. Let's just put it that way. Um, we don't get everything that the people downtown get. That's, a, that's another conversation that we can, you can invite me back to to have. Um, so uh, with respect to the question asked, um, I was not one of these people who had a lifelong dream of being a lawyer. Um, I grew up in New York City, uh, the only daughter of a, a single working mom. Uh, from Puerto Rico, who, you know, she was trying to survive and she did the best she could, but um, I did not envision um, that that was something on the table for me. Let's put it that way. Um, I went to public schools in New York City, <laughs> the good and the bad of them, and uh, uh, then, like, sizing so many people in the room, right? You know, we don't get to yell by ourselves. Uh, somebody picked me out of the crowd, and I was able to get a scholarship. Uh, and the scholarship was to a private girls' school in New York City called the Nightingale Bamford School for Girls on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, and <laughs> back when 95th Street used to be the cutting line. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> dating myself. Uh, in any case, uh, that scholarship then, you know, uh, through the A Better Chance program, ABC, enabled me to sort of expand my horizons. But I have to say, I still didn't think uh, in big picture, you know, at this point, I thought, okay, well, I can get myself a job that pays. This is kind of like um, how I envisioned what the scholarship did for me. Uh, so from there, I got another scholarship to go to Brown University. I didn't even think to apply to Yale. I, I just, it, it, it didn't seem to be in the cards. Let's put it that way. Um, and what I quickly discovered was that so I went in there with notions of I want to have a job that will you know help me pay back my student loans, um, but also I wanted something professionalism. You know, like I was the first person in, in the family to go to college, um, and I didn't want to fritter well, what I thought at that time of, of frittering away uh, the degree. Uh, and so I first went in thinking I wanted to be a conservator of a museum. Uh, I or an art gallery. I was very into the arts, but I thought I can't be an artist. I can't afford that. Business, business will pay bills, and so I thought, well, this will be the business then. No, nothing about it. But you know, even a poor kid has access to museums, uh, and so I had access to museums. So I go to Brown, and uh, very quickly into my career as an undergraduate, uh, I discover all the racial tensions that are on campus, um, and you know. We had, like so many campuses uh, in the 80s, but and unfortunately continuing to today, uh, our issues of hate speech and violence and you know targeting of students of color. Uh, and so I started to become very active. Uh, we had an organization back then called the Federation of Puerto Rican Students, FEP. Uh, and so through FEP, I spread my wings um, as far as uh, you know trying to speak power about what I thought were problematic issues. Um, and that still didn't bring me to law, right? I, I still had this um, 
what I characterize as a first generation student idea of the only way that I make this worth it to my family is that I come out of here with a job that pays. Uh, and so I'm kind of sort of following two tracks. You know, I'm, I'm engaging in all kinds of sort of leadership roles and issues of social justice on campus. Uh, and at the same time, I'm trying to shoehorn myself uh, into what I envisioned as an idea of um, what a business person would look like, having no lead, you know, no guidance, no uh, no mentorship of that kind. I had other kinds of mentorship, but not that kind. So anyway, I graduate from college. I get myself that job. Investment banks seem to know this girl not probably the, not the right one for us. Um, but I get a management position in a, a, a management training program with Bloomingdale's, a big fancy store, in New York City, also on the east side. Uh, and I thought to myself, hey, I've arrived, you know, I've got like this management job. And I quickly discovered that nobody was talking about social justice issues. I mean, not even like union management stuff. And uh, I felt like a fish out of water. I mean, it was diverse, at least in the staff level, not at the management level, uh, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't feeding me. You know, it was helping to pay some bills, but it wasn't feeding me. Um, and as I like to say to my own kids, it's nothing like a bad job to help you learn what you want. <laughs> so like it crystallizes very quickly. So there's a value in all those bad jobs. <laughs> um, you, you appreciate the good ones and you have a little more patience for the bad sides that come with any particular endeavor. So um, I'm looking for a way to get out of there. And what I discover is that when I go back onto campus for, the, you know, what, what jobs are left <laughs> um, for on-campus, uh, um, positions and when I find our law firm jobs, paralegal jobs. I'm like, it's a job. At least I'll be talking about issues. I'll take it. So I get into this law firm and it happens to be a patent law firm. Uh, and I'm quickly getting to the end of the story, uh, which is um, filled with people whose undergraduate degrees are in science and engineering and tech um, in order to facilitate their clients' uh, needs uh, legally for issues of patent and what have you. Uh, which wasn't my you know zone but what i discovered was it was still an environment where uh issues mattered uh and even if we weren't always working on social justice issues there were at least people in the uh, building who wanted to have conversations about them and explore them and think about them um and so i quickly came to realize you know i never thought of myself as lawyer material um but it seemed to be a space that would let me explore the issues that I cared about. I didn't know what that would mean. I thought, okay, well, I'll go in and I'll do immigration law. I thought I'd be an immigration lawyer. Um, uh, there are some of my fellow classmates in the room and they'll know what I say when I, I took an immigration law class and uh, that quickly turned me off to immigration law. Um, the instructor at the time uh, had a habit of um, viewing, well, let's put it this way, every immigration problem had a hypothetical named Maria the maid. I'll leave it at that. Uh, and so I was like, this is the guy who represents immigration law. And I had no other models, right? I have never met a lawyer uh, um, in life. And so I thought, okay, well, this is not for me. Uh, in any case, all of that led me then to be able to be in a place where I could explore the things that I cared about, racial justice, uh, uh, violations of rights, um, and disproportionate use of power, right, against the most vulnerable. And I took a series of job, different summer jobs. I'm happy to talk about them during the Q&A if anybody's sort of like interested in that kind of like lawyering path. Um, and fast forward after a number of jobs, graduating law school, more jobs, you know, um, and I, you know, got something out of all of them. But this, but I came to a point where my, my last supervisor, of, you know, like a full-time legal employment, said to me, you know, Tanya. Um, Everything you're writing is very interesting and you know, really quite illuminating. <laughs> but the judge really only wants five pages. You know, um, it's a motion practice. <laughs> the judge doesn't really want to see like you know, tomes of like, you know, with footnotes and meaning, but I'm writing in a scholarly vein, but not for a scholarly audience. Uh, and so I thought, well, to really talk about what I want to talk about, I need to go someplace where they'll pay me to do this. Academia. And then what I discover, and I've been in the business now 25 years, uh, is that, thank God for me, I like the teaching part too. 
Now, mind you, that's not what I got really hired to do. The, this is sort of the dirty secret of academia um, and higher education, right? You know, it's that you get paid to write essentially and shine some light on the institution by what you publish. Um, but students are, you know, uh, not as important. But what I discovered was that my same social justice concerns um, that I want to explore in writing um, really came alive in trying to share this with students uh, and to uh, be as helpful as I could in the production of knowledge with their growth and their exploration and things that they would write and go out in the world and do. Um, and so, you know, I've never regretted kind of where that Bloomingdale's job took me to <laughs> um, ultimately. Um, and why law as opposed to like other things that you know I could be doing. I think it's because it provided um, the two things that I valued the most was direct individual concerns like you know what does this client need and how can I be helpful and thinking about things from a broader picture as well how does this one client's issues and being navigated through the law affect broader society um, and so I've always liked uh, thinking in those two ways um, and law enabled me to do that I'm just so happy that you talked about people don't give enough credit about that and my god we should we should have at some point another conversation about all the bad jobs we have to go through to get the, to get the good ones um you know, I, I wanted to turn a little bit to your work which is super rich and it's published everywhere i mean from all the law journals to the most high regarded presses and and specifically you know and i use all of them i've used all your work in different class, classes that i've taught over the years uh talking specifically about um the first i guess it's the first long project maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong but racial subordination in latin america the role of state customary law and the new civil rights response um in which you actually challenge this idea of latin america being um, a more equal like racially equal or less racist society than the US, um, which is a, a view that was held for so long by many scholars, the idea that because Latin America had this presumed racial democracy, it was less racist than the US that had this kind of bi-racial system. And all of this had been like a lot of work had been done in terms of defending that um that perspective. More recently, other scholars or other legal scholars have argued uh, more similar along your vein of there has been a general convergence um, in which or, or at least the, the both systems are more convergent and more similar than they are different um, and i was wondering uh, can you tell us a little bit about how this debate entered the current situation the impact of an current anti-racist activism globally um, you know i'm thinking here of hashtag blm uh, but others as well, um, especially, you know, even those organic to Latin America. Um, and, you know, how have this new uh, anti-racist activism, global and local, um, have sort of impacted the more traditional expressions of racism in Latin America? If you can tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, because, you know, I think what your question enables me to do um, is to address the confusion people often have. Not, maybe not this audience, but I'm gonna put it out there anyway. Um, and, and this is the confusion that I um, hear a lot. Is, oh, how are all these people in Puerto Rico and Venezuela and all these different places doing with these placards uh, up that said Black Lives Matter, right? As Dios Negros Importan También. They were like confused. Was this just allyship? <laughs> um, you know, they, they care about what's happening in the US uh, to black bodies. Um, and what um, part of what was misperceived, at least initially by um, the media, uh, even Univision, amongst others, uh, was that this was well, certainly allyship in its most global diasporic perspective, but it was also about a personal concern and investment <laughs> in the anti-Blackness within those people's own places of living, right? Uh, so, yeah. Indigenous born anti-black racism within Puerto Rico, within the Dominican Republic, et cetera. Um, and of course I can go on the list. <laughs> and what that moment there um, with everyone with their pl placards, both in Portuguese and in Spanish, you know, across uh, the Southern hemisphere, uh, what that was about was not just a frozen moment, right? It wasn't just, oh, oh, we're, 
Black Lives Matter, Woo, but, but that's interesting. No, this was a, a decades long evolution in thought, right? That is to say, uh, you know, it's longer than this, but you know, one significant milestone, of course, uh, is the 2001 uh, World Conference Against Racism uh, in South Africa, uh, in Durban, South Africa. Right? Uh, at this conference, black social justice movements showed up en masse like particularly from Brazil, but from many other places within Latin America and the Caribbean as well, right? This animating uh, global conference facilitated what? Sort of the international law politics of embarrass your nation state and make them act right <laughs> in a nutshell right, of international law. Uh, and so basically you know, people of color speaking for themselves and not their elites. And not the Latin American elites and Caribbean elites saying, oh, we don't have racism here because of course it doesn't touch them, right? They benefit by it, right? This white privilege, even without a white identity, although there's plenty of white identity going on as well. Uh, and so having that uh, dynamic of viewing uh, the anti-Black racism movement as being across the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora, those numbers help what? Move against that constant, so centuries long rhetoric of there's no racism here. We're, there's no black, there's no white. We're just all Cuban. We're just all Chilean, what have you, right? Um, and, or the alternative is, well, you know, how can you tell? Because don't, don't so we're all mixed, you know, so there's no way to tell who's black and who's white and da, da, da. And I listen to, you know, Tarzan and I, you know, worship at the Orishas. And so how can, it, how can you possibly say that I who look like, you know, could possibly be a beneficiary of white privilege, let alone complicit? in the caste system of anti-Blackness and anti indigeneity across Latin America. Um, and so the what we were seeing over the summer sort of across the region was not just about that moment. It wasn't just about empathy and um, allyship with regard to George Floyd and many others. Right? It was about a longstanding uh, move, so social justice movements uh, in, in each of these um, places uh, and conversations. Right? Um, and so, I have considered myself really quite fortunate that um, the big major book that you referenced, right, the racial subordination in Latin America, that was really facilitated from my consultant work. It, it, meaning, I had been looking at issues of racism in the United States, right? and I, uh, you know, for my writing and what have you, but I found that as an Afro Boricua, that I had a particular lens. Right? And that my lens was, I could see where a US-based conversations about, well, the growth of the multiracial population means that we won't have racism like we have in the past because we'll have many more people who are mixed. And that means that we can't be racist against one another. And I didn't quite buy that because my life of going back and forth to Puerto Rico and traveling across Latin America and the Caribbean had shown me that, you know, that, that's a good talk that Misty Sahe talked. Um, but it still allows very entrenched, segmented, and segregated spheres of opportunity. Right? Um, and so I was constantly using the Latin American sort of research uh, to, to redirect the conversation about race in the United States. Um, and so being in those conversations brought me into places like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the United Nations, and other uh, sort of international operators um, to be sort of in conversation, right, uh, and consultantship with people who cared about kind of having a keen idea about what was going on as far as race was concerned in Latin America, the Caribbean, such that it affects the GDP, right? You, you may think, well, what is the international American, you know, what is what does international banks care about this but it's stuff of blackness in Latin America and the Caribbean? They care because when they loan money to nation states and those nation states are not availing themselves of all the talent and the full labor market, right? Um, when you have stratified socioeconomic opportunity, that, that, that undermines the ability to pay back the bill <laughs> to the World Bank right? and to others. Uh, and so they care uh, because money is on the line. Well, they may be, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, good-minded people as well, la, 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 la. Uh, but, but at the same time, the money is on the line. 
So being in those rooms, having those conversations, doing working papers, right, and, 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 and talking with these various social justice movement actors, um, and how could law be helpful? Was, was US law a good guide? Maybe US law was a bad model. What were they doing? All of that then culminated me in thinking about the role of these activists and the evolution in approaches to law to deal with that book, Racial Subordination in Latin America, right? So it was like the culmination of lots of short pieces, short articles, longer law review articles, um, but all in conversation with uh, social justice activists that then culminates in sort of like the larger book uh, project about um, these issues within the region as a whole. Great, thank you. So like one thing that I've noticed often is that a lot of elites that are part of, uh, they view this racial justice initiatives as trendy and they're very aware of what is the right language to talk about them, right? And so that's one thing that I noticed with the elites in Brazil to, to a larger degree, but also in Puerto Rico, that they would never say, oh, we're a racial democracy or there's no racism. They would not say that anymore, even if they continue to act as if that were the case. But the language it has become very global in terms of what is acceptable and what is not, which is, is a, a great kind of like way to see the how it works in the bottom and how the law and, and the activism has led through this different kinds, different stages that you describe. Um, Can I one second, one second though? Um, because here's the interesting thing, at the same time that there is more of this um, sort of corporate diversity speak right, that right. is put out through the world, at the same time that, that is happening, the moment that you press these elites about the commonality in status and in acts of anti-racism, that's when you get the pushback. That's where you meet the limits of the corporate diversity language, right? That's when you get with, oh, that you know, oh, oh. It's not the same, but there's a lot of power inserted into that idea. It's not the same, or which is code for don't come to me with that U.S. race stuff. You don't really know what's going down here. And we don't need any of those civil rights things like you all got in the United States because the hour, it's not the same. It's, it's not as bad. Sorry, I just couldn't help but my two absolutely, on absolutely that's exactly what i found and especially when you confront parents with their children's privilege which was my area like once you get to parenting that's when everybody like nobody wants to be very progressive anymore and nobody wants to go to the local public school you know that kind of you know that's when like it stops even among the most progressive um you know presumably uh groups um so in your more in 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 more recent work. I mean, you've done so much recently that I like. I'm just gonna like highlight um, the 2018 book, but we can talk about the other the other work. Um, so the title of the book: Multiracials and Civil Rights: um, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination. Um, and there you challenge look, we're U.S. centered, and you challenge the view that uh, multiracial uh, persons, which Latino might. Sort of some Latinos might be included in, um, experience a distinctive, unique challenge when it comes to the enforcement of civil rights laws in the US. And if I understand the argument correctly, you're noticing that that's not necessarily true, that maybe we need to increase the way in which civil rights laws are understood. But in reality, um, you know, we may, we may want to deepen the reach of those laws um, to remain attentive to you know, how the intricacies of white supremacy and bias against non-whites operates. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more, like how would you imagine such a legal system, particularly in reference to Latinx populations? Um, you know, for, from a legal standpoint, how does your analysis integrate like intersectionality and particularly in reference to forms of Latinx heterogeneity um, along language or, um, or just even it, you know, it, legal status or sexuality or social class. Um, how do you think that that intersectional model might in, might work with this mix with this idea that multiracial persons experience the distinctive um, forms of challenges under the law in terms of accommodating them under the legal apparatus as it exists. I entered that book project uh, in much like I sort of enter so many of things. Like I read something, or I hear somebody talking, and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> and my intuitions to 
and I could find a fashion, but still to explore and dig deeper about sort of why do people, why are people saying that? Why am I thinking it doesn't seem right? What else is there here? So I've been reading and hearing a lot about these ideas that with the growth of multiraciality, right, that race would change in the United States. And part of the idea that it would change is also that the way that the story goes, right, that multiracials have a different identity, got it, fluid, and that that different identity also means that they're perceived differently when there's discrimination. It's a whole new thing that we've never seen before in the United States. And so our anti-discrimination law, uh, here the story goes, is built on white versus black and doesn't understand anything else and is incapable or inadequate for dealing with this whole new world. That's the story, right? I then go in to look deeper and the way I do this, in case I got some research wonks in the room and wonder, what's my methodology? My methodology uh, was that I went through statutory in case law, meaning an anti-discrimination case law. When you think you've been discriminated against, where do you go besides talking to your friends about it? When you're really a bit burnt up, you go to court, right? Uh, you know, this claim. So I went through uh, these stories of discrimination as uh, you know, evidenced in cases. Um, and this is what I discovered, that yes, multiracial identity uh, starts off differently in the sense that the claimant says, my identity is, right? and they insert a, a, a label of their choice biracial, multiracial, multiethnic, what have you. But then when they describe and they say, judge, what happened to me was, it ends up being very story. It's black, white, but a story of white versus non-white. Discrimination. Tanya, I think and you're getting a little white privilege as well. Or right. a message that might. Can you guys hear me? Yes, but I believe you're breaking in and out, and we're having a bit of trouble hearing you. Can you hear me? Now yes. we can hear you. Oh. Oh, you can? Okay, um, because I can sort of jump on my phone if that is going to be a problem. Um, okay, somebody said in the chat, could you repeat the last thing you said? The last thing I was saying, um, and I don't know, like raise your hand if, you, if I can't be heard, um, is that when you go to a judge and you file a claim and you say what happened to you, what the stories from these multiracials were was a very binary story that uh, time and time again, it was about whiteness versus non-whiteness, but it was still a binary. Uh, and that this is something the judges understand. So the irony was that I was hearing a story that anti-discrimination law doesn't work for the new demography, the more fluid identified demography. But the actual cases of discrimination where people speak for themselves and say what's wrong, and many of these cases were pro se, meaning they had no lawyer, so they were just literally writing and talking for themselves, uh, were claimants who were describing not having the discrimination be about being mixed, uh, about having fluid identity. They were describing discrimination about not being white, which judges understood and that they were winning the cases. So that was confusing to me. I was like, why do these commentators say the discrimination law is not good enough when in fact, these are the claimants who are often winning, which is very unusual in discrimination law, let me tell you, uh, for lots of reasons that warrant a whole other conversation. Uh, so the reason why I think that's useful and it actually filters into the um, project on Latinos specifically is that there's a discourse about discrimination that is not matching up with what the what anti-discrimination law intervenes in. So that is to say, when Latinos get accused, this is the new project, right? When Latinos get accused of discrimination by Afro-Latinos or African-Americans, there is a rhetoric on the part of the person who's accused, the Latino will say, 
I can't be racist. This is not about discrimination. I'm Latino, so how could that be? This has to be something else, a miscommunication, a misunderstanding, a vendetta. There's always some other reason as to why it's not about discrimination. Right? It's the use of demography, way to say it's not African-American and white Anglo, so it's not about discrimination. Like this, this same rhetorical um, deflection against the consistent apparatus of white supremacy is constantly being run away from. Uh, and so uh, I'm firmly in the camp that, you know, yes, one should be attentive to changes in demography and fluid identity uh, and what have you, but we all need, to, people care about social justice, we need to keep our eyes on the ball. And here the eye on the ball is the way in which systems of white supremacy maintain racial uh, hierarchy. Uh, maybe the hierarchy now is a little bit longer and stretches, stretches out further across groups, but it's still a hierarchy. And even if you're sort of in the middle versus at the bottom, it's still a problem because this is about an inherent uh, view of a limitation on your in intellect, your talents, and your capacity for being viewed as a full citizen in this uh, you know, society and many others as well. Uh, so, you know, put together, uh, I like to joke that uh, Inadvertently, I've done like a science fiction tr uh, trilogy, you know, the one, the two, and the three, right? You know, one was all about Latin America, two was about the US and this multiracial idea seeping in from Latin America and Latin American and Caribbean uh, migrants in the United States, talking that good mixed talk, right? Um, and then part three is this like dig digging deep, right, into the ways in which that mixy talk. Uh, within Latin American and race, uh, uh, Caribbean uh, communities, right? not just migrants, communities uh, within the United States uh, also hides anti-Blackness. So uh, put together, it's almost like one big package. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I feel that it gives so much texture also to this idea, like Kim, you know, Kim, Kimberly Crenshaw's idea and, and others like on intersectionality and it, it almost like pushes that even farther, um, which I really appreciate um, how your work does that. Um, I was like curious, you're, so you're, you're published everywhere, as I said before, and you've also been translated into Spanish and also Portuguese. Um, have you noticed any, like, can you tell us a little bit about your audiences, the, the different audiences and how they've reacted to your work? If you know, um, if you've been able to tell about that? Well, you know, it's so interesting, like, you know, once you put it in print and then it's in the covers and it goes out and, like, who knows what happens, right? Um, but with the advent of social media, I now get much more of a sense of what happens when something kind of goes out there. In the old days, I'd have to wait for someone to actually write me a letter or, you know, whatever. Um, it's very different now. Um, and so what I find is that... Um, I write on topics that sort of tend to speak against, you know, what is a, a sort of low hanging fruit of the idea of like, you know, things are going to be so much better because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I kind of push against those, what I view as very simplistic approaches to dealing with the complexity right, um, of racial discrimination. Uh, and so I often expect that there will be um, hostility you know, to what I have to say. Um, certainly I've gotten a fair share of hate mail uh, to talk about issues of anti-Blackness in short op-ed pieces um, where, you know, a Latino audience is real quick to let me know, like, I don't know what I'm talking about because of this and this and that, you know, as if I, I'm not Latino also. Um, but my, but my latino gets erased by pointing out anti-Blackness. Um, somehow that Americanizes me more than <laughs> anything else, it would seem. Um, but I don't let myself sort of get discouraged because at the very same time that there's that pushback, there are people who write me, uh, DM me <laughs> uh, on Twitter and elsewhere to let me know how valuable the work is to them. Um, you know, I, I write across different audiences because I don't want it to be just left in sort of this academic US English speaking only world um, because I'm not in it just for 
the um, the notion of, oh, I've written a book, aren't I something? Or as my kids like to say, as a published author, <laughs> that's throw that at me. I'm getting get too uh, big for my boots. <laughs> oh, oh, as a published author, she doesn't have to do the dishes. Um, so uh, it's more than just, being, <laughs> you know, it's not just about being a published author. Um, it's about that I want, I want to, I want it to matter, right? You know, I guess it, it just goes back to those earlier questions. I know that you asked me for like, how did I get involved in this whole about business and. And, you know, what was I thinking when I went to law school? It's that I'm very cognizant of still being, you know, that only child of a single working mom and the first in the family to go to college. It's like, I'm going to do something that's just for me, that it's not for everyone else. Um, and so even though it sometimes feels like it takes just as long to write a 500 word op-ed, <laughs> right? Because you got, how can you say it? What you want to say? Just to fight. It takes more work to say little than just like the go on and on and on, right? Uh, in a, a book length with chapters and footnotes and what have you. Um, but even though it takes just as much work for, for what looks like such a smaller payoff, because right? it's just 500 words, I do it because I don't want my idea to just be some scholarly idea. Um, I want it to give um, sustenance to people, right? I'm not um, such a Pollyanna that I think like, oh, one little thing I wrote is gonna change the world, right? But I do think that just like one person can help someone else, even if it's just one other person, each of us helping each other, that I know from people talking to me and writing back to me that they have found um, strength uh, in what I write, in what I talk about, and doing the little YouTubes and all this other kind of stuff. Because sometimes the best thing that you can give to somebody else is the sense of, I'm not crazy. Like, this stuff that I see and I think I'm not alone. Uh, and sometimes people don't have a vocabulary for it. They don't have sort of a, a framing for thinking it through. It's sort of the very same a value that I find in teaching critical race theory year after year um, is giving my students both um, a vocabulary and a grammar right, for being able to articulate what they see and think um, in ways that a, the, their broader education has not facilitated, you know, put it that way. Um, and so to be able to have the work published, you know, it, it was such a huge, um, it was, a, it's been an incredible experience, right? To be able to not have the Latin American work stay in Cambridge University Press's website and frozen forever, right? You know, but to be able to travel to Colombia uh, and lots of other locations to, you know, to talk about the work um, and to then have it published and translated both through pub two different presses in Latin America. One was with Uniandes in, in Bogotá, in Colombia, and the other was Casa Las Americas in Cuba. Um, and I was there two or three years ago, I've lost track now. Um, it was before the Trump thing came down. Uh, so <laughs> I was able to get in there. Uh, and Casa Las Americas uh, sponsored a talk where I was able to Sort of revisit the issues in the book because there was a Cuban edition of the Spanish language um, version of the book, as well as the Portuguese one in Brazil. And in any case, um, it, I have viewed it as sort of a great blessing uh, and uh, I'm a great gratitude in my life to be able to have had those experiences that I would never have envisioned being able to do. And just, I guess, sort of like if I had one take, take away from the audience for students in the room, right, is that there is a value in following your passions. Even if you don't quite know where the paycheck is going to come, like, <laughs> I didn't know when this paycheck was going, um, but it came and the travel came and the good stuff came and the, you know, buying a house came. Um, that stuff can, you know, it'll happen, right? um, but it shouldn't happen at a sacrifice for what you pursue and what you, what you value. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm only doing social justice. You know what I came to find out afterwards, and I guess I'll, I'll sort of end uh, right here with, with in response to this question, was that, you know what, I could have done a lot of this work as the, as the conservator of the museum. I left doing that because I thought, I have no business doing this art stuff when like my people are dying in the streets. Like I had a whole hard talk conversation with myself. Nobody was saying this to me. I was saying this to myself, right? The same like, you got to do business. And if you want to do social justice, there's only like one way to kind of do this, you know, go work for Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. And, you know, and I did had a job with them as well. Um, but you know what, I, we, need to, we need to be everywhere, okay? Uh, and I have a colleague, um, 
Irene Davila, who works uh, at NYU doing stuff on Latinos and the arts. And it is like some of the most like revolutionary, like righteous stuff. Um, and I, you know, I count myself so lucky to like know and be in conversation with her, collaborate with her on things. Um, so like I could have been doing this work for as, the, as a museum curator um, and as, as we can all, I, I guess I, I, I'll shut up there uh, to get some other questions or other issues that people want to like, uh, you know, talk about. Well, thank you so much for this incredible talk and event. I'm literally gushing on the inside because this is absolutely wonderful and so engaging. Uh, we are going to be going into the break now. However, we want to open up the floor for any questions. Feel free to raise your hand if you have a question and uh, direct it to either Professor Hernandez or Professor Ramos Zayas. Thank you for such an incredible event and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well if anybody wants to ask any questions there. I apologize if I went, it was so long-winded that I ate into the break. I apologize for that. You get me started on these topics, like it's hard to stop, keep quiet. No, feel free to take up space. That's what the celebration is about. Lourdes, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, well, first of all, hi to my classmate, um, Tanya. It was wonderful to see her in, in this role. Um, I'm wondering if in your scholarship, are you also grappling with the intersection with gender? Thank you for that follow-up too, because I forgot someone in the chat had wanted me to talk a little bit more about intersectionality, and Anna did too, and then I got caught up in another strand and I forgot to circle back to it. Okay. So essentially, you know, intersectionality is all about looking at multiple vectors, right? Um, not only of identity, but of how people perceive you and how that then uh, influences how you are positioned racially and otherwise, right? Uh, so to take it from the perspective of an Afro-Boricua woman, right? Um, right? The way she lives in the world is not just only about being a woman, only about being Boricua, but also about being afro Um, And so the way in which the intersectionality comes up the most in a lot of my work um, is for two ways. One, looking at the ways in which uh, women of color have often been at the and continue to be <laughs> at the forefront <laughs> of uh, social justice movements. And then secondarily, about the ways in which they are victimized and discriminated against, um, very much is about the sexualization of racialization. Right? So um, when they get um, bombarded with issues of discrimination, it's also about um, ways in trying to make them a sexual object, right? This idea of the exotic mulata um, or, you know, whatever skin color you may be, right? Is, you know, celebrated as a source of pride in salsa music, but at the same time, it's the way in which you get sexually harassed in the workplace uh, and many other spheres and, and apartments and what have you, you know, looking for an apartment, your landlord harassing you. Um, and so, in the work that I do and sort of like telling the story of discrimination, that is the place, those are the two places where I most deliberately are am using sort of this intersectional lens. Although intersectionality is not limited to just looking at cross sections of race and gender, right? It is much more multidimensional than that. Um, so that this is where, you know, looking at, well, I'll stay with the sexual harassment example and then I'll be quiet to be create more space. Um, with sexual harassment, what makes you more vulnerable is not only being a woman of color, in the stats that show that, uh, but also not being documented. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one additional layer in, right? Of not being undocumented, right? Because that's another way in which people can disproportionately lose their power. And so that's why there's that mischaracterization of sexual harassment, it's like it's about like sexual desire. Eh, no, it's about people disproportionately using their power to do whatever they want to do to whomever. Right? Um, and so, if you're uh, living at the intersection of various vectors, you can be more disposed uh, to not only more frequent sexual harassment, but also more violent forms of sexual harassment. I see another question in the chat from Jose. Um, it says, Dr. Hernandez, may you speak more about how Latinos didn't see themselves discriminating against African-Americans? Did you find themes or trends? Yes, this is interesting, right? 
uh, when it came to um, the in the research um, that I'm currently engaged in in looking at the cases where it was an African American as opposed to an Afro Latino, right? Because there were equal numbers of these cases. Um, when it was an African American who was the claimant, often the defense would be, ah, it they didn't understand. We were speaking in Spanish, and so they misunderstood. They, you know, they thought that every time we said negro that it was about them, but it really wasn't about them. Um, and they just resented. Right? They used a sort of cultural, pseudo-cultural defense, right? Um, as a uh, idea that it's a mischaracterization or a misunderstanding um, that, or that African Americans are much too sensitive. And so that if they hear anything about blackness, but we don't use that word the way you use that word. When we say it, it could be like a, 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 a sign of love. Um, and so, you know, you've got it all wrong. So even though I gave you the worst shift, even though I wouldn't give you a pay raise, uh, even though you were segregated, right? That's not really material because when I use negrito, I don't mean it the way you think it means in English in the United States. So those are some of the patterns that I saw quite a bit of uh, when it was an African-American claimant um, as opposed to an afro latino one. I guess I had a, a follow up and thank you for that. Uh, just speaking to that point, what would you say to us? Because we actually may have our own blind spots. I work at the Puerto Rican Action Board. And when George Floyd happened, there were a lot uh, the African American staff members. We had this uh, open forum to discuss this in the organization and to talk about uh, what are some of the potential blind spots that we're not seeing. and. It was interesting because a lot of the Latinos were like, why are you having this conversation? We're all people of color. And as people talked about those things, I, you know, on kind of on the background, people were like upset that people were speaking truth. Uh, because the fact is, is that sometimes we don't see that, particularly since it's a Puerto Rican uh, Latino founded organization that even though we're multicultural, the fact is, is that African Americans were not feeling that they were fully inclusive of the of of the they weren't fully part of everything and some and in learning about this there were things that we i learned that the way that people were talking to folks but the people who they were talking about were offended and thought you know i've worked for black people and how could you say that but what message do you have for us particularly in the areas that we we have those blind spots I think it, um, in this in the short time that I have here, because I'm doing a whole book on it, um, <laughs> it's that I would say that the main takeaway is, you know, simply because we too experience discrimination, right? Meaning to say that Latino isn't a category that is both ethnic and not also racialized, really, you know, would be deceptive. Of course it is. You know, children in cages at the border. That's about racism, right? Um, that's not just about Latinos in an ethnic category. Um, and so the idea that people who are discriminated against can't also be complicit, both consciously and unconsciously in, in, in um, uh, problematic patterns of exclusion and bias um, really needs to be reexamined. I mean, just like, you know, when people sort of react in um, white Anglo spaces with their white fragility, right? Um, oh no, not me, la la. Uh, <laughs> you gotta get over that because how is it that we're gonna be able to make our society truly egalitarian if everybody's walking around on eggshells as far as like their own personal feelings? Um, sometimes it's not just about you. <laughs> that is to say, it's not just about like, did you use the right words? Did you say the right thing? For me, I'm a very sort of materialist when it comes to issues of, of discrimination. I, I care about systems and I care about patterns, right? So meaning, if you could say all the nice things in the, if you want in the world, right? you know, like, welcome black people, you could hang your black, hashtag Black Lives Matter sign right up, you know, lots of people do, they got that big old flag right up on the front side of the building, like, please don't riot here, here's my BLM sign. Um, you can hang those in the, in, the, in the workplace or elsewhere, but if you consistently negate the ability of black people to be able to have 
and I use the word black in its big diasporic umbrella sense, right? Um, if you negate the ability of black people to be able to really fully realize citizens, right? to truly be equal partners in whatever the enterprise may be, joining and speaking, having positions of power, what have you, then what value is the symbol of the flag? Doesn't mean very much, does it? So professor, um... I want to go to the issue of identity. And um, I have no issue with anything you've said because I found myself going back to the 1970s, having exactly these debates with the people from the PSP and other of my friends from Puerto Rico um, who were engaging with the New Yorkers. But we came to the race issue with completely different perspectives, obviously, because of our experience. So I agree with you 100%. I've always had that issue with the elites on the island. Um, that said, I find myself in the unique situation that I understand the term Afro-Boricua to sort of be used to affirm our African heritage, but I have problems with it. I have always been Boricua. Now you want to call me, I always call myself Trigueño, but you want to call me Mulatto, you want to call me Negro, you want to call me I won't curse you, whatever you want to call me, whatever type of, but soy Boricua. I've never been hyphenated. I can understand the Afro-American or African-American, Puerto Rican-American because of the way this country developed. But I've never, it's only now that I'm encountering people all of a sudden hyphenating. And I, I, I react to it. I react to it because it's like, I'm not hyphenated. Yo soy Boricua 100%. Now you want to call me Negro, you want to call me Mulat, you want to call me Pendejo, you want to call me whatever, go ahead, add it to the Puerto Rican. But just say Boricua, I'm not having it. It's not like there are Puerto Ricans and then there's us hyphenated, we're kind of Puerto Ricans. While in the United States, there's a validity to that because of its particular history. In Puerto Rico, if you follow the history, we were the majority until the 1800s where you have this new whitening of all of the Spanish coming over and all the people escaping the revolution throughout Latin America. And Puerto Rico goes through a new whitening and then we get these elites. But even there, I was always called Puerto Rican. So I was just curious, I, I, I struggle with that. And there are times when I've used it, when I feel it's necessary to sort of emphasize our African heritage or my African heritage, but as a general rule, I really don't like being hyphenated. And I was just curious what your, your reaction is to that. I have a reaction and I'll probably be as concise as possible. <laughs> and, <laughs> and here it is. I think that, what, I mean, Africa, obviously people call themselves different things for a whole myriad of reasons. So I don't you know, claim to be able to say what all those reasons are, but this is what I have observed, right? That simply saying Boricua, I know when my abuelita would say it, she was trying to say, and don't try to call me black, right? You know, so there's different ways that the, I'm just Boricua gets used, right? Um, and I think that part of the impulse for some, for people to put the Afro in there is to be able to work against those abuelitas y abuelitos and others who want to be saying like Boricua is like this nice little, you know, mantel that we put on top and then we don't look behind it to talk about issues of blackness. At least that's what black people right? The um, last thing I would say is that like my great mentor, Miss you rest in peace, Miriam Jimenez Roman, my view has always been to say, I'm black, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. I think that for uh, many Latinos, they are somewhat uh, feel uncomfortable because they fear that what black means is that you're saying you're African-American. And sometimes they feel that that means that I'm me stepping in spaces I'm not supposed to be stepping in, um, or I'd be maybe misperceived as trying to appropriate or what have you. But I like to think from a South African mentality as well, right? You know, black is a big, big tent. Um, and so I say it. Now, I guess I care, in my, this is my own personal opinion, I care less about what people call themselves uh, and more about what they mean behind what they call themselves, right? So, you know, if somebody's saying Boricua and they're like, the fro is a flying and they are all about like celebrating um, and giving space and value to our African heritage and not just what I always hear, 
you are so proud of our Taino heritage. <laughs> um, ain't never met a Taino in their life and got killed by the Spains in the 1500s, but they all about the Taino ancestry and the tattoos. Oh, sorry for so many people in here like that. Um, but I say all that, I simply say, right, regardless of what the labels mean, I don't get too caught up on the labels, I get much more caught up in what do you mean behind what you are saying? What are you not saying when you say what you say? <laughs> Daniel, you've had your hands raised for a while. You can go ahead and ask a question. Yes, please. My question is actually kind of related to this. Um, you know, I live in a neighborhood that's highly Dominican and the Dominicans here always say that they're not black. You know, so I'm curious in your work, you know, this whole almost self-loathing, self-denial of the African experience, you know, I mean, they're clearly perceived as black by other people, but they don't see themselves like, have you explored that in your work, just this sort of dual identity and dual crisis that's kind of at play? The thing is that we have to be cognizant of, just like, you know, in the United States, that we can um, look at the ways in which our educational systems have completely um, ignored, and when they have turned to issues of, of race and racial histories, messed it up. Like, you know, there used to be a thing called slavery. Uh, the votes came and then there was Martin Luther King and boom, we are all free, right? Uh, and that's all you get in school and you barely get anything better in college, but I'll leave that for you all to decide. Um, and so the woeful sort of lack of historical perspective combined with nation states putting out propaganda to uh, discourage people from acknowledging their African ancestry, right? That takes a toll. Um, and so, you know, within uh, the D Dominican Republic, there's been a long and problematic history of the nation state being directly involved in telling people, you are, you, no, 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 you are not black. <laughs> um, and so that takes a lot to intervene in. Right? Uh, and at the same time, there are also social justice activists on issues of uh, racism who are very black identified within the Dominican Republic, but they don't get the same space, right? Um, the, 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 the view of, oh, it's all this self-hatred and it's a Dominican thing. We got it all in the in Boricua world too and lots of other spaces. Um, and they take much more of the heat uh, than the rest of us do. Uh, and I think part of this is we need to have really racial education across the board uh, in ways that will intervene into the miseducation right, that we have had for so long in so many places. Adriana, can you so speak louder? Because for some reason I can't quite hear you. Sorry, I think my headphones have weird speaker things going on. Is that better? Okay, um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little more on, um, and it's not a fully formed thought because I'm also not the the most like well read on the the growing conversations um, in like race theory within Latinidad, but kind of on the flip side of things, um, there is growing maybe criticism or confusion around wanting to identify as like Afro Latino. Um, or Afro Boricua, um, and the flip side of that, of like, there's much less, people don't have as much of an issue on like white Latinos not identifying as white and only using Latino and kind of how there's like that, that difference in, and it's all within the context of like anti-blackness in Latino communities, but just, if, if that makes sense, it's not a full question. It's just a, if you if you have anything to elaborate on that. I appreciate that. I really like that idea. And uh, um, I hope that you quickly write about it because, girl, I think I may use it. Um, th that was so insightful, right? This idea of the lack of symmetry in the Latino response to hyphenated names, you know, or, or, uh, or, or the um, disinclination to use hyphenation. I think that is like powerful. You're pointing out hypocrisy uh, is uh, you are on your way. That's not, that is a fully formed thought. <laughs> it's a very useful one. I highly encourage you to write about this um, or you know, talk to me about it some more and I'll steal it from you. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, 
I, I would say that, you know, seeing that dichotomy uh, is very revelatory. Uh, and there is a really interesting book um, that I recently reviewed in the Latino Studies Journal, uh, all about uh, Hispanophilia, and then another one about, about white Latinos. Um, they gave a uh, Haslip, Viera, uh, edited. Uh, and in both of these uh, volumes, what he does is he engages the social media conversations right, of Latinos in regard to questions about whiteness and sort of the ugly surfaces fast. And then he does sort of a racial deconstruction of it. I highly recommend you check those, uh, the edited volumes of Gabriel Haslip uh, Biera out. Hi, so uh, we have one question in the chat and then we're gonna take one last question from Nathan who's had his hand raised. Um, but here in the chat from Juan Garcia it says, Professor Hernandez, would you expand on your discussion of the quote unquote de facto caste system in Latin America and how it operates to exacerbate or support existing structural inequalities and stratification of societies in the region? Thank you. The best thing that I would point to um, is this book called Pigmentocracies um, that Edward Delis uh, put out. Because what he does is in that book is that he takes the um, countries that have the most significant numbers of both Afro-descendants and indigenous, and what he tracks, he's a sociologist. And so in, co in collaboration with sociologists and anthropologists and economists in the various regions, right, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico, and I'm trying to think of the last country, I forgot now, because um, there's four major countries that they use as case studies um, and then look at patterns elsewhere. What they documented right, from their deep dive into statistical analyses and what have you, and using a paleta, a skin color chart <laughs> for their um, uh, surveyors to like, you know, mark uh, where people fell, let's put it that way. Um, what they found time and time again is that the darker you were in any of these countries across Latin America, the worse off you were. Right? Um, that even when as good social scientists, when they did multivariate regression analyses, blah, 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 <laughs> that's that talk. What they, and they could control for level of education, people with the same level of education, skin color variance was still significant. Right? So that is to say that it is not just about class, that usual black, you know, kind of a um, deflection that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean and that it is also about race and skin color and the way those things are conflated together. Right? And so the caste system is a very real one. As much as the same time that we say, oh, we're also mixed that we can possibly identify one another. Well, you know what? The police officers seem to have no problem whatsoever figuring out how to fill their jails with only the dark-skinned people that they choose to arrest for all the very same crimes or what they perceive as crimes out on the street. Um, and the very last thing I'll also point out, this is also work done by Edward Teles and some others, are the studies of twins. He did it in Brazil and some other places where this is done. Meaning twins, because you know how we come in different shades. <laughs> um, but when they're twins, same family, right? Same biological structure, yada, yada, yada. But one is darker, one is lighter. What the studies show in Latin America and the Caribbean is that the lighter of the twin does better socioeconomically even though they come from the same social capital, right? And the same attitudes about education or what have you, this is the same parents. I mean, it's a perfect um, natural study, if you will, to look at twins who have an, uh, a different arrays of skin color within a single family. And Nathan, go ahead and ask, you get the last question. Great. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was more or less interested in some of your research about Latinos in the U.S. and how they see race. So um, more or less along the lines of different regions of the United States, um, because, you know, my father was in the military for, for many, many years. And so I've kind of been all around, mostly the East Coast, but pretty much all around the United States um, and kind of seeing how different, you know, Latinos react in different ways. And I've noticed um, I've lived in the South for a very long time. Um, my family is originally from the Massachusetts area, Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and I've noticed back home, uh, the whole, you know, receptions idea of, you know, our blackness uh, hasn't really, you know, had too much popularity. Though, um, when I was down south, you know, I, I kind of had a little bit more 
of a desire to really kind of reconnect with that part, mostly because of, you know, the way that race is viewed in the South. Um, and so there's been a disconnect between, you know, how me and my family down here uh, kind of views race and how my family back home in Massachusetts views race. And so I've wondered, how do Latinos in different parts of the United States uh, view race? Like, I've also noticed, like, Latinos who live in, like, maybe New York, New Jersey, more urban areas are also more likely to, you know, engage with this part of our ancestry and they engage with Black issues and maybe even call themselves afro Barriqua. And so I just wonder, how does, you know, the different places that we've, you know, lived in as the Puerto Rican diaspora, how does that make us more or less likely to engage with these Black issues? In my research, I try to be as um, encompassing as possible. And so when I was doing Latin America, I took on all the countries, even though people said to me, that is irresponsible. Each country has its own history. <laughs> yes, that is true. But when you're looking for a seeing to see where there's a central commonality and the central commonality is about anti-Blackness, you know what? That Cuba is socialist, so, so, so to speak, and Venezuela is not, or it is kind of, but Chile is different. I don't care about all of that if I'm still seeing anti-Blackness in common. Right? Okay. So same with the United States. I, you know, take stories from wherever they came. I got, I did national searches for cases uh, so that I'm looking at, you know, not only El Paso, Texas, but also Chicago, also LA, right? um, New York, Newark, et cetera, right? Wherever I find a case, I go for it. And this is what I have discovered, right? Well, um, what you are describing, Nathan, as far as sort of how people formulate their racial identities can vary a great deal depending on demographic density, right? If you're in Miami, it's sort of a different sense than if, if you are in Utah, right? Just saying, right? Numbers do matter as far as what um, aspects of your identity you find most salient, that you find that you have the most resonance or hospitality, you know, people are, are, are hospitable to it. You know, if I'm in a room with other parents, the thing that feels most salient to me is just like how beleaguered I feel as a parent sometimes. These kids that don't appreciate me, bah, 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 right? I'm still the same person, right? But different aspects of my um, identity surface. Um, however, regardless of the different uh, ways of identifying and interacting with Black Lives Matter or, or other issues, right? What I unfortunately find very consistent is this stream of anti-Blackness, right? So that I have, that that's why I have cases in El Paso, in Chicago, in Newark, et cetera. I haven't really found one just yet in Alaska. I bet you if I search hard, I might be able to find it. Um, and so um, this idea that, you know, identity can be so fluid and, and changeable, this is true. But I have always been, maybe because this is the lawyer in me, I guess this is maybe the perfect way to end it, right? You know, what's so salient about a, a, a lawyer talking to you as opposed to somebody else, right? It's because as a lawyer, I'm constantly trying to look at the bottom line, right? Identity is fluid. It changes. It can change from moment to moment. You go into one room with different people. Other things may seem much more important and salient to you as your aspects of your identity. But issues of anti-Blackness as a systemic and cultural phenomenon that is something that um, to me is immaterial as about what your identity is, unless your identity is social justice concerned individual who wants equality for all, right? Um, and that should come whether or not you're calling yourself Boricua, Afro Boricua, White Boricua, I'm just American, you know, <laughs> whatever it is you want to say. Um, that platform should not be exclusionary with regards to um, recognizing the the full humanity of others and according them, you know, equal civic space. Well, that concludes this event. Thank you so much, Professor Hernandez and Professor Ramon Sayas, where she is. <laughs> um, and, you know, I hope you guys enjoy the break and I hope to see everyone later on this even at this evening's event. Um, thank you and take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.